on this morning of worship, we then turn our attention to the word of our God. This is the third Sunday of Easter. Our first lesson, our Old Testament, or really our historical lesson, is found recorded for us in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 12. We're actually hearing the end of that healing of the, of the uh, man in Jerusalem by the apostles. You're hearing the end of that account. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we are being questioned today for a kind act that was done for the lame man as to how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that it was by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him this man stands before you healed. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you builders which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Here ends our first lesson. Our next lesson is our epistle lesson. That epistle lesson is found recorded for us in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, and then finishing up with chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. We're reminded of the wonder and the marvel we have in Jesus. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have observed and our hands have touched regarding the word of life, the life appeared and we have seen it. We testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We are proclaiming what we have seen and heard also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We write these things to you so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we heard from Him and proclaim to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him but still walk in darkness, we are lying and do not put the truth into practice. But if we walk in the light just as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar, and His word is not in us. My children, I write these things to you so that you will not sin. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the whole world. Here ends our epistle lesson. Alleluia, alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. Our hearts were burning within us while he was speaking to us along the road, and while he was explaining the scripture to us, Alleluia. Please rise for the gospel. Well, the gospel for this morning is found recorded for us in Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 49. Glory be to you, O Lord. Do you know this text will serve as the basis for our sermon? As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were terrified and frightened and thought they were looking at a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of their joy, and while they were still wondering, he said to them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and some, some honeycomb. He took it and ate it in front of them. He said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, this is what is written, and so it must be. 
But Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witness of these things. Look, I am sending you what my Father promised, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Here ends our gospel lesson. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God that we wish to contemplate for ourselves this morning is found recorded for us in Luke chapter 24, that gospel reading. Let me highlight for you verses 46 and 47. He said to them, This is what is written, and so it must be. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Thus far, God's word lets you and I continue with prayer. Gracious Father, again, thanks and praise and glory and honor that you allow us to gather to give you that worship and praise that is certainly deserving to you. And we give that worship and praise to you because of your son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done and accomplished for us. Help us to grasp the marvel of Jesus, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. You have to appreciate what it is that Luke records for us here in his gospel. It really is the account of the appearance of Jesus to his disciples, and that was the appearance on the first evening of the resurrection. But what's interesting is that Luke gives us some well, some different details, and if you pay attention, you recognize that those details kind of fit our human nature. For instance, the disciples are clearly having a deep discussion with the two disciples from Emmaus who had returned to tell them that they had seen the Lord and all the circumstances that had happened with that appearance of Jesus to those two disciples. See, that's, that's really what that opening line is referring to of our gospel as they were talking about these things, talking, about, or talking with the two disciples from Emmaus. A and I think that line and an understanding of the day helps to set the stage for what we hear in this, this reading. So all day, beginning with early in the morning, strange things were going on. The women reported angels who declared, He is not here. He is risen. One of the women, Mary, spoke directly with Jesus. Of course, remember, she mistook him for a gardener at first. We're also told that Jesus appeared to all the women as they were on their way back to the disciples from the tomb. And then here come the two disciples from Emmaus and, and their account. So all of these events, all of these things to contemplate, and, and yet at this point, the majority of the disciples have not seen him and maybe even at this point seem a bit skeptical that they will. And then it happens. The doors are locked. They are deep in conversation and there stands Jesus among them. Luke captures the nuances of the reactions that are found among this group. He recorded but they were terrified and frightened and thought they were looking at a ghost. i got to tell you, that statement just stuns me. I mean, seriously, just contemplate deeply that statement. Now, please note that Luke was not an eyewitness, but it's commonly accepted by almost all that Luke interviewed, he investigated, he deeply explored all things Jesus as he wrote his gospel message. So Luke heard directly from the people involved that this was their reaction. And then I want to remind you that the Holy Spirit, who is inspiring Luke, he also allows him to write this sentence because it is true. They were terrified. And please note that word is assisted by a, they were frightened. Two words to describe their fear. And I say, really? All day long you've been hearing that Jesus is alive. They have before them, and I'm assuming that the women are there in the house with them, they have before them some seven to ten witnesses who have told them Jesus is alive. 
And now here he is, and, and this is their reaction? I mean, it's, it's not joy, it's not an awe or a sense of surprise, it's not even a sense of total giddiness because there is Jesus, but it's terror and fear. I guess it just goes to remind us that there's, if there's one thing that we can be sure of in our lives, it's the fact that we are the most unpredictable. We are the most illogic of creatures in the world. This reaction just doesn't seem the most godly for a group of disciples. But what a marvel Jesus is here. With absolute calm and patience, he says, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So here's Jesus leading them gently away from their foolishness, leading them away from their inept human minds that can't seem to grasp what the word resurrection means. They think a ghost? Some sort of apparition, earthly apparition that may or may not be there. Jesus says, no, no, it's me. Look at me and the wounds that I carry. More than that, Jesus says, touch me. Make that flesh-to-flesh -flesh contact to reassure yourself that I am absolutely, really, and truly standing before you, and I am exactly the same as it was before I died. And then did you notice the next observation that is found for us in verse 41? That verse says this. While they still did not believe it because of their joy, and while they were still wondering, he said to them, do you have anything here to eat? Now, there are some important things there for you and I to contemplate. Note at this point that the terror and the fright are gone, and it's replaced by total amazement, such Stunning amazement that they're still having a hard time understanding what they're seeing with their eyes and hearing with their ears and, and even touching with their hands. At the same time, there is absolute joy, intense joy, so that again, it's clear their human minds at this point can't comprehend the reality of it all. And that's when Jesus asked for something to eat. And while they watch, he eats the broiled fish and the honeycomb that they provided for him. And there's a simple lesson there. You see, ghosts and apparitions and imaginations do not eat, but Jesus did. And it says to them, he is alive, he is well, he is right before them, and by the way, his wounds clearly don't bother him and doors don't seem to stop him. Jesus, the one that everyone thought was the Messiah, is the Messiah because he is right here in front of you, and he's eating some fish. And it says, he lives, and he is our Savior. Now, honestly, if, the, if that were all that this text had to say to us, the, the information in itself is enough for us, and yet that's not all the information that's found in this text. Our, our next lines are very important. Our, our next lines really are the heart and core of our faith, and our confidence in Jesus, the risen Savior, our, our next lines will lend us the theme for ourselves for today. And that theme is, this is what is written. Now, there are a number of points to be made as we contemplate this particular theme. And the first thing we want to do is just to remind ourselves of what it was that Jesus said to them. He said this, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So here's Jesus simply reminding his disciples of exactly what he taught them. And what he taught them is so wonderfully simple and yet so mind-boggling, boggling, isn't it? The simple truth is that the scriptures are about him. And you might say, well, which part of the scriptures? And the answer is, well, all of it. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Every bit is about Jesus. That's why in many cases I, I don't understand why people would say things like, how do you say Jesus is this, or how do you say Jesus is that? I mean, what proof do you have? Well, dear people, the proof that we have is the Old Testament scriptures that, that lay out everything, and I mean everything for us. So, for instance, scripture said the Christ would be born in Bethlehem of the house of David. 
Now please, just explain to me how Jesus, growing in his mother's womb, accomplished that. Well, dear people, it was accomplished because it was the plan and the will of the Father. It was accomplished because that's what Jesus came to fulfill. It was accomplished because the Holy Spirit just doesn't get things wrong. Or, for instance, the prophecy that Jesus would die while hanging on a tree in Jerusalem. Did you know that at the time that particular prophecy was written, crucifixion didn't exist, and Jerusalem was soon to be destroyed? And yet that prophecy got fulfilled. For the soldiers at the cross, those soldiers gambling for the clothes of Jesus prophesied in Scripture. Oh, oh I know. I'll just bet that Jesus made some sort of deal with them about his arrest and his dying, and, and that's why they're gambling at the cross, because of a deal Jesus made with them. And the answer is no, people. No. It was a miraculous fulfillment of God's holy word. Such points, literally, such points just go on and on. Jesus fulfilled them all. Well over 350 points of prophecy that the average Joe can find and see fulfilled in Jesus. That's not coincidence. That is the scriptures written about Jesus. And then we read these words. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, this is what is written, and so it must be. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And again, here are some wonderful points. First, it takes the Lord, the Lord, to open our hearts and minds to the marvel and wisdom of his word. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 says to us very clearly, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Or you and I can look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and there we read these words. The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from clearly seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is God's image. For the God who said, light will shine out of darkness, is the same one who made light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Faith and the ability to grasp the wonders of God's word and its lessons is simply a gift from God. Jesus gave his disciples that gift that they might see all the more the awe and the wonder of God's gift of salvation. And then did you notice what Jesus draws their attention to next? He said this, this is what is written and so it must be the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. This is what God's word said of the Christ. This is what God's word said of the promised Messiah of God who would come and rescue God's people. Jesus tells them that that lesson, that prophecy was as clear as could be. The Christ would suffer and rise from the dead. And of course the marvel is that's exactly what Jesus did. Uh, we, we, of course, covered all that during our Lent season as we contemplated the passion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Suffer? Yes. In such a way and manner that you and I still cannot fully comprehend it. What we have learned is that Jesus suffered eternal damnation, what you and I would call hell, for each and every one of our sins. Suffered for us. And then Jesus died. Breathed his last and experience the trauma of the separation of body and soul. That's death. That's physical death. But death could not keep its hold on Jesus. His body was quickened. That means it was given its life back. And Jesus breathed again. Jesus lives and exited the grave as a new and totally glorified Savior. And that's really the heart of it, isn't it, dear people? Again, as I have said so many times, when, when someone tells you they are going to die and rise again from the dead after three days, and they do that, listen to him. And then grasp that God's word had said the same thing. So the, the lesson is what? Listen to it. And do you begin to see how Jesus 
and the Word of God are really the same thing? It was written, and so it must be. It was done, and so we are given life too. And of course, that's the last part of this verse that you and I need to grasp. Jesus told his disciples the result, the result of what he would do. He said, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. There it is. Um, that's what all of us are here for. We're not here because we're such awesomely amazing people. We're not here so that we can figure out how to live better and obey Jesus better in order for us to earn eternal life. We are here because of the message of repentance, because of the message of the forgiveness of sins found in Jesus. We are here because of the grace and love of God that is poured upon us in Jesus. Because despite our rotten, our no good selves, God in love grants us forgiveness in Jesus. I don't do a thing, and neither do you either. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of faith in Jesus. It's the message that we have heard, the message of Jesus found written in the Word and fulfilled in the living Word, Jesus. He has paid for our sins. He has won the victory for us over sin, death, and the devil. And he grants us this forgiveness, the joy of eternal life and salvation. This is the message of the word, both the written word and the living word. And all I can say is, listen to it. What is really awesome is the simple fact that as you listen to it, the Holy Spirit, we are told, is going to come and the Holy Spirit is going to work his change in your heart. And because of the work of the Holy Spirit, you and I are going to become new and different creatures. We become the children of God. We're filled with the awe and wonder of our Heavenly Father and so very happy because of our brother Jesus. And we think, we think of living right and following the Father and sharing his love and, well, really, the list of things that we're going to do as God's children is pretty long. We end up doing this not because we have to or to earn anything. We do it because we can't help ourselves and because we have been granted everything in Jesus and his victory. Who it all started in Jerusalem? Jerusalem is where Jesus came to to be, you know, uh, brought before the temple and all that stuff. Jerusalem is, of course, where Jesus suffered and died. Jerusalem is where Jesus rose from the dead and literally and seriously changes the world. And the message is simple. There is a God, and he has sent his Son to be our Savior from sin. We know this, we grasp this, and we, jo we, we rejoice in this because this is what is written. You know, the other, the other day in Bible class, uh, we got to hear the absolute wonder of this, uh, the wonder of, a, of a, the vision of the throne room of God. And what a picture that is found for us in the book of Revelation. The throne of God surrounded by the 24 creatures, or the, uh, the throne of God, rather, first surrounded by the four living creatures, and then those creatures are surrounded by the 24 elders uh, who are sitting on 24 thrones. And every time the creatures would sing, then the elders themselves will sing, would sing. And then surrounding those 24 elders sitting on their thrones, we're told that there are thousands, actually 10,000 times 10,000 angels. And those angels then would sing this, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I, I really am brought to think about those words as, as Jesus is speaking to his disciples, as Jesus is revealing things to his disciples, as Jesus is helping his disciples to grasp that they are forgiven, that they are children of God and heirs of eternal life. And I marvel all the more because really that message that they hear and they grasp, they're going to take that message to the world just as Jesus asked so that even today you and I we still hear about the glory and the joy and the salvation of Jesus that is given to us. 
And my prayer is simple. Lord, may we never cease to hear of this great and eternal Savior of ours and his call for repentance and his forgiveness freely given to us. It's what is written, even for us. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do indeed come and give you thanks and praise and glory and honor for the gift of your Son, Jesus. Even though we were dead in trespasses and sin, you, dear Lord, promised and then fulfilled that promise of sending the Christ, the Messiah, who would be our Savior. And dear Jesus, you indeed came and fulfilled all things that the, the law, the prophets, and the, and the Psalms said about you. You came and were, were our Savior. You went to the cross there to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then, just as the scripture foretold, you rose again from the dead to proclaim the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and salvation, a gift that is now ours simply by grace through faith. Continue, dear Lord, to be our help, our guide, and our strength. Continue with your Father to send your Holy Spirit upon us that we might all the more grasp this, this joy, this awe, this wonder of your victory, which is our victory. Be our help, our guide, and our strength. And dear Lord, we also come to you on behalf of the many members of our congregation and all those whom we love. May you be with them and watch over them. And if they're experiencing trials and tribulations and difficulties and troubles, we ask that you would be with them. We ask, dear Lord, that you'd use these opportunities to remind them that you are their God and Lord, to remind them that you have given them all things and that in you there is peace and comfort and joy and marvel. Because we recognize that your will will always be done and your will for us is always our eternal life and salvation. Encourage and help us in all things. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.